So about three years ago, I was in London, and somebody called Howard Burton came to me and said, I represent a group of people, and we want to start an institute in theoretical physics. We have about $120 million, and we want to do it well. We want to be in the forefront fields, and we want to do it differently. We want to get out of this thing where the young people have all the ideas and the old people have all the power and decide what science gets done. It took me about 25 seconds to decide that that was a good idea. Three years later, we have the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in Waterloo, Ontario. It's um, the most exciting job I've ever had. It's the first time I've had a job where I'm afraid to go away because of everything that's going to happen in this week <laughs> when I'm here. Okay. So, but in any case, what I'm going to do in my little bit of time is take you on a quick tour of some of the things that we talk about and we think about. So we think a lot about what really makes science work. The first thing that anybody who knows science and has been around science is that the stuff you learn in school that is a scientific method is wrong. There is no method. On the other hand, somehow we manage to reason together as a community from incomplete evidence to conclusions that we all agree about. And this is, by the way, something that a democratic society also has to do. So how does it work? Well, my belief is that it works because scientists are a community bound together by an ethics. And here are some of the ethical principles. I'm not going to read them all to you because I'm not in teacher mode. I'm in entertain amaze mode. But, <laughs> but one of the principles is that everybody who is part of the community gets to fight and argue as hard as they can for what they believe. But we're all disciplined by the understanding that the only people who are going to decide you know, whether I'm right or somebody else is right are the people in our community in the next generation, in 30 and 50 years. So it's this combination of respect for the tradition community we're in and rebellion that the community requires to get anywhere that makes science work. And being in this process of being in a community that reasons from shared evidence to conclusions, I believe, teaches us about democracy. Not only is there a relationship between the ethics of science and the ethics of being a citizen in a democracy, but there has been historically a relationship between how people think about space and time and what the cosmos is and how people think about the society that they live in. And I want to talk about three stages in that evolution. The first science of cosmology that was anything like science was Aristotelian science, and that was hierarchical. The Earth is in the center, then there are these crystal spheres on sit the sun, the moon, the planets, and finally the celestial sphere where the stars are. Okay. And everything in this universe has a place. And Aristotle's law of motion was that everything goes to its natural place, which was, of course, the rule of the society that Aristotle lived in, and more importantly, the medieval society that through Christianity embraced Aristotle um, and blessed it. Okay. And the idea is that everything is defined, where something is, is defined with respect to this last sphere, the celestial sphere, outside of which is this eternal, perfect realm, where lives God, who is the ultimate judge of everything. Okay. So that is both Aristotelian cosmology and, in a certain sense, medieval society. Now, in the 17th century, there was a revolution in thinking about s space and time and motion and so forth of Newton. And at the same time, there was a revolution in social thought of John Locke and his collaborators. And they were very closely associated. In fact, Newton and Locke were friends. Their way of thinking about space and time and motion on the one hand and a society on the other hand were closely related. And let me show you. In a Newtonian universe, there's no center, thank you, okay. there are particles and they move around with respect to a fixed absolute framework of space and time. It's meaningful to say absolutely where something is in space because that's defined not with respect to say where other things are but with respect to this absolute notion of space which for Newton was God. Now similarly in Locke's society there are 
individuals who have certain rights, properties in a formal sense, and those are defined with respect to some absolute abstract notions of rights and justice and so forth, which are independent of what else has happened in the society, of who else there is, of the history, and so forth. Okay. There is also an omniscient observer who knows everything, who is God, who is in a certain sense outside the universe, because there's no role in anything that happens, but in a certain sense everywhere, because space